I should explain a little bit about why I want to do illustrated music. I'm 78 years old now, and I've written a pile of music, over 100 compositions. Some of them are rather long and with lots of musicians. But I have a feeling that they aren't really finished. Maybe more important than just adding more things to the stack, I should go back and finish the earlier things. What do I mean by finish? Because these are all scores that have been published for a long time and played well at least a few times. But they seem unfinished to me. Because in the 80s and 90s, I never did drawings of what I was doing. I never tried to explain visually what the music was doing. And I never even wrote very many program notes. And today, I think uh, it's important to do that. In the 21st century, I've been doing quite a few drawings, wanting to see the visual parallel with what the music is doing. And that's very useful. So I went back to old pieces to explain them, do drawings of them, try to illustrate them. Um, Music for 88 is a good time to talk about that because this came at an important moment. I'm already established in Paris. I've already written a lot of counting music, a lot of uh, rational melodies, uh, and the intuitive geometric logic of nine bells, things that I could do just intuitively. But I'm starting to think, I want to go further than that. So I found that there was a course in number theory uh, taught by Michel Waldschmidt. And I asked him if I could audit the course. He said, fine. He was, I uh, found it very interesting that there would not only be math students, but this crazy musician who wanted to write mathematical music, also in his course. Well, this is a high-level university course, and I only understood about half of what was going on. But I learned what I could, and Michel was very nice to answer my questions. And uh, he also introduced me to another mathematician in France, Jean-Paul Alouche, uh, who helped me a lot later on. I talk about him in automatic music. During this period, I also went to the library quite a bit, the mathematics library. I read uh, Euclid, all eight volumes, not just the volumes that people um, study in high school uh, as geometry. And there was, um, I got deeper into Pascal's triangle, read some things, Fermat and uh, uh, Euler's harmonies, um, different things. Found out about abundant numbers, which I'm going to talk about soon. And uh, all of this led to uh, music, which became music for 88. Performed in 1988 with the 88 keys of the piano. Piano recitals that I did at that time. One of the things that I was interested in doing and made a piece called Squares came from a theory of Pierre Fermat. Uh, rather simple. The theorem says that any odd number squared divided by 8 will leave a remainder of 1. Um, this is not obvious, but uh, let me go to the piano and give you a demonstration. So, to divide the square odd numbers by eight, I needed to have a bass line of eight notes. So I took this note, counted up four, counted up three, counted up two, and counted up one. And in this way, I made a scale that you know already. Everybody loves this scale, boogie woogie. Four, three, two, one, one, two, three, four, four, three, two, one, one, two, three, four. I'm sure the reason why everybody loves this little melody is because of its arithmetic. With this eight note bass line, we can divide these odd square numbers. Three squared, for example, 
And that's going to come out, obviously, with a remainder of one. Nice cadence, both lines ending on the bass note. Let's try five to five squared. Perfect. Seven squared. as it should. Nine squared. Second time. Third. Fourth. Fifth. Sixth. Seven. Eight. Nine. Again. But um, I'm sort of reaching my limits. I, when I, in 1988, I went out to 11 squared, 13 squared, uh, uh, very far. As I was rehearsing this piece, Javier Ruiz came to town. I played it for him, and he was um, very pleased because he said, I remember this piece from 1988. You remember you came to do a concert in Tenerife? It's true that in 1988, I was playing uh, music for 88 in several different places. And one of these concerts was in Spain, uh, Canary Islands, Tenerife. Uh, Javier was uh, just a student at the time, but he loved music and mathematics as much as I do. And he still uh, remembered that uh, concert, which uh, was very important for him. In fact, uh, after that, he bought a copy of uh, Rational Melodies. And a few months later, he sent me a computer uh, engraving of the whole Rational Melodies it was beautiful, because at that time I was still doing uh, scores by hand, like most composers. And it was so nice to have it all looking so beautiful with a computer. So I paid him for that, and he became my copyist for quite a few years. Later, uh, he, well, now he has a, degree in computer science and he does a lot of work with the internet in Barcelona where he lives. But uh, he also continues uh, sometimes copying for me. He did a lovely score for Un'Opera Italiana and he designed the book uh, uh, Other Harmony. And he continues to be my webmaster. So we see each other from time to time. But after he heard this piece again he said, you know, I'm not sure that's a theorem of Fermat. Fermat's one of the best uh, number theorists of all time. And the Grand Fermat theorem, that a squared plus b squared equals c squared, is only possible with certain values, very few values of a and b. And uh, this idea that uh, square, odd square numbers uh, leave a remainder of one is, uh, is trivial for somebody like that. I mean, any mathematician could, could figure that out. Any engineer, anybody who studied math a little. Well, I was impressed because I didn't know how to do the algebraic proof. But he showed me how to do it. And I'm going to show you. So now, uh, you've heard the theorem. You've had the musical demonstration out as far as I can play. And now I'm going to give you the algebraic proof, which will really fully illustrate squares from Music for 88. So this video version of squares is a little bit dedicated to Javier Ruiz and the 30 years of friendship that we have had since uh, that concert in Tenerife in 1988. And I'm going to give you Javier's proof. Uh, an odd number is 2k plus 1. Any number that's 1 greater than, than 2k is going to be odd. And if we square that, the theorem tells us that 
we're going to get 8 something plus 1. Let's multiply that out. That gives us 4k squared plus 4k plus 1. And um, let's take out the 4. We get k squared plus k plus 1. If we take out the k, we get 4k, k plus 1. Now, the important thing is that if k is even, k plus 1 is going to be odd. If k is odd, k plus 1 is going to be even. In any case, the product of an even number and an odd number is always an even number. So, we know that this is going to be um, 2 of something. So now all we have to do is add the 4 and the plus 1. And what do we get? 8m plus 1. 8 of something plus 1. So now you have the theorem, perhaps, from Fermat. The musical demonstration that it can, uh, is going to work at the piano, at least as far as I could play it. And the mathematical proof from Javier, which uh, tells us that it will be um, true out to as many uh, odd numbers as you want. So now, um, you have squares completely demonstrated musically and mathematically. We can go on to another piece, Euler's Harmonies. So now we're going to talk about Euler's Harmonies, another piece from Music for 88. Um, Euler was a, one of the most important mathematicians of the 18th century, and uh, I can only understand half of what he wrote, uh, or less than half. But I, he wrote a book around 1730 called Mathematische Musik, which I can basically understand. Let's look at a page from that. Uh, as you can see in this page, he really uh, went into a lot of details. Um, but the theory is very simple. He's just taking uh, the small prime numbers, 2, 3, and 5, multiplying them together in different combinations, and taking all the multiples of that to build a big chord. The first example, and Javier wrote this out in uh, modern notation, um, so you can see that he just took the, uh, always with a fundamental of F, he took the second harmonic, a higher, an octave higher, third harmonic, an octave and a fifth higher, and uh, he multiplied two times three, which gave the sixth harmonic, that is the third harmonic of the second harmonic, or the second harmonic of the third harmonic, and we have this chord, which is a complete set of multiples. But it's more interesting when we go on to 2, 3, and 5. Now we have 1, 2, 3, and 5, 6, 2 times 5 is 10, 3 times 5 is 15, and 2 times 3 times 5, which is the 30th harmonic. I can show you another example, which will take us a little further into the theory of Euler. Here the uh, prime numbers he uses are 2, 3, and 5, and 5. You can have 5 two times. 2, 3, 5, 6, 10 as before, 15 as before, but now also 25, which is 5 times 5. Um, that's the fifth harmonic of the fifth harmonic. <coughs> two times, three times five, uh, and uh, 50, which is two times five times five. Let's listen to that. There are two more notes up there, which go off the keyboard, which would be G sharps, three times five times five, and two times three times five times five. But they're there. Somewhere, if you have good ears, maybe you can 
imagine that there, those notes also are coming off of these overtones. Let's listen to that a little more. But now let's go back to 1988 and listen to the Euler harmonies as Tom Johnson composed them at that time and as he played them at the piano. Uh, while you are listening to that, I want to show you a drawing that I did. Um, there are 11 Euler harmonies in the composition which you're going to hear. <coughs> Each one is heard twice. But I made up four Euler harmonies in this drawing, which uh, you see here. There's a, uh, prime numbers at the bottom and the uh, overtones drawn above in numbers. When Javier saw this, he said, uh, hey, um, that has nothing to do with it. That reminds me of flowers growing out of some prime number roots, or maybe overtone balloons floating in the clouds somewhere. Now that has nothing to do with either with music or with mathematics. I suppose he's right. But um, I love the drawing. And uh, if it helps you to somehow go beyond the music and the mathematics, that's OK.
You probably never heard of abundant numbers. I never had either until those days in the 80s when I was going to the math library. I ran across the idea. The idea is very simple. It just means numbers that have lots of divisors. It's an old idea, probably as old as Nicomachus in Greece in the second century, maybe older than that. There's probably even references in Euclid. In any case, uh, the smallest abundant number is 12. 12 is divisible by 1, 2, 3, 4, and 6. 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4 is 10, plus 6 is 16. 16 is greater than 12, so 12 is an abundant number. It's abundant in its musical possibilities, too. Let's play, let's say the numbers are going to be uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, and 6, and let's play the note six, six times, once every two beats in a 12 beat cycle. And let's play note four, four times, once every three beats. Let's add the note that occurs three times, once every four beats. And now let's add the notes that will only occur once or twice per cycle of 12 beats, and we have the complete music of 12. Uh, 18 is an abundant number also, but that's just about the same. It's, we're just replacing 9 instead of uh, 4. Uh, so I'm going to play, skip to 20, which is a little more interesting because it has devices of 1, 2, 4, 5, and 10. So we'll start with 10, which is going to occur 10 times in every 20 beat cycle. We add the five, which is occurring five times in every 20 beat cycle. And we'll add the other two, three divisors. and we have the music of 20. Uh, many higher numbers are abundant, 24, 30, 36, 40, 42, 48, and 54 are all abundant, but um, it's more interesting to skip to 60, which is extremely abundant. I did a drawing of 60, which um, you can look at here. As you can see, there are 11 different divisors, each one in a different concentric circle, uh, and um, each one occurring a different number of times. The problem is that sometimes uh, you have to play a lot of notes at one moment, and you don't have enough fingers, you don't have enough hands. 
So it's impossible. So I remember uh, I was frustrated with that. I spent a lot of time figuring out how to um, change the beginning points of each rhythm in such a way that it would be playable. And uh, we ended up with another drawing, which is not so symmetrical, not so logical looking, but it's playable. So now, let's go to the recording of 1988 and let Tom Johnson explain it uh, with his voice, which is 30 years younger than my voice, and uh, uh, with his piano technique, which is better than my piano technique today. Uh, and you can uh, follow the cycle in the drawings as you go. The next abundant number is more abundant than all the others so far, and it produces a very rich music. 60. 11 different divisors. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 10, 12, 15, 20, and 30. As we approach the limits of the keyboard, we also come, inevitably it seems, to 88. This number gives us a kind of music different from that of the other numbers we've heard, because it is divisible by 11. The divisors of 88 are 1, 2, 4, 8, 11, 22, and 44. And the music of 88 sounds like this. <laughs> 